The story of Matthew Lyon, also known as the Spitting Lion, has it all, including being thrown in prison for speaking out against the government and the president. Matthew Lyon was birthed just beyond Dublin's bounds in Ireland in the year of our Lord 1749, whilst the Emerald Isle stood under British dominion. In his tender years, his father met the executioner's blade meted out by the British crown for treason against the realm. And so as a young lad, he found himself obliged to ply a craft, toiling to sustain his widowed mother and himself. So in his early teens, he embarked upon the path of the printing trade. At the age of 15, he voyaged unto the American colonies, a redemptioner, also known as an indentured servant, vowing to labor in servitude for a chosen patron or the very shipping enterprise that bore him until such time as his debt of passage was fully discharged, arriving in the colonies at a time of growing discontent with the British crown. In truth, these indentured servants did bind themselves to a temporal slavery until the day when their obligations were fulfilled. The yeoman's life was in bondage until he could settle his debt and interest of his voyage. Mostly were these indentured men hailing from the humble stratum of English laborers. A monetary value was affixed to these contracts, rendering them commodities for purchase by other hands during their term. If a white-skinned servant did flee his indenture, more years were appended to his bond if caught. But lo, for those of Ebony Hugh, a lifetime of slavery oft awaited if they attempted to flee their contract and were caught. At the close of their term, the shackles were cast aside and these souls were endowed with freedom dues, a package usually encompassing land and provisions, usually to include a gun. Picture, if thou wouldst, thyself, a sojourner in our current age, hailing perchance from a land to the south of the American border. I, with an ardent desire to set foot upon the freedom soil of the United States. So, instead of rendering coin to the cartel, a coyote's fee, thou proposeth to sell thine service unto one infamous Jack Handy, pledging six years as his apprentice in the craft of comedic penmanship, whatever that might portend, with no pay, in exchange for his sponsorship of thine aerial passage and his provision of board and chamber and food throughout that span. When the term hath run its course, Jack Handy bestoweth upon thee parchment, a pen and an inkwell, a computing device, a printing press, a couple of acres of land, and a gun. Now you're a freeman in the United States, and you have a gun. Indeed, it was an age very different from our present. Back to Matthew Lyon. In his youthful prime of 15, he found himself bound by indenture, a servile covenant. He toiled first under a merchant farmer, then passed under the hands of another, who as a merchant farmer allowed him to earn coin beyond the stipulated indentured hours. With those earnings, he chiseled away at the debt that shackled him. Until the year of God's grace, 1768, the proverbial bonds fell asunder, and he emerged as a free man after four years' tenure as an indentured servant. He worked as a farmer until he transplanted himself to Vermont in the year 1774, being then 25 years of age. And upon that verdant soil, he tilled the earth as a farmer and organized a militia company comprised of local settlers. Behold, the Revolutionary War erupted, and in July of the year 1776, when the nation United States emerged in tumultuous birth, he was bestowed the rank of second lieutenant, ascribed to him in the ranks of the Green Mountain Boys. Not a banjo symphony, but rather a militia commanded by Ethan Allen, famed for their conquest of Fort Ticonderoga a little over a year before his commission. Amidst the early throes of the Revolutionary War, he was tasked with a defense mission, a task familiar to all who have donned the soldier's mantle, whether in the ranks of the regular army or the modern manifestation of the well-regulated militia, the National Guard. Guarding a thing of mundane and boring nature, while the tempest of true conflict rages elsewhere, is a frustrating experience for many with a warrior heart. It matters not if the object be of paramount importance, for the mind deems it dreary and purposeless. And when comrades return from the field, a chasm divides. A camaraderie forged only in battle eludes, and thou art cast as an outsider, especially for those with an unwavering spirit of action like Matthew Lyon. Thus, he found himself guarding wheat fields, a plight that stirred his ire. Ought he, by mere dint of his farming vocation, stand sentinel over wheat? His anger deepened, and he demanded assignment where the action was. Then he gets in trouble for his unwillingness to stand guard, and he was cashiered for cowardice, a military degradation ceremony, a ritual that temporarily dismisses an individual from responsibility for a breach of discipline, often accompanied by a shameful display of contrition. In this instance, Matthew Lyons surrendered his weapon and bore a wooden sword, a token of his shame, 
in front of his fellows. This did not sit well, and his command did finally relent, stirred by external persuasion from an old confidant, the commander of a regiment, Seth Warner by name. So he joins Seth Warner's ranks and is sent accompanied by a promotion to the rank of captain. Throughout the Revolutionary War, he served as an officer, his presence marked in the Battle of Bennington, the Battle of Saratoga, and other less confrontations where not enough people died to call them battles, yet lives were lost and the scourge of war was manifest. After the Battle of Saratoga, he departed Warner's regiment, ascending to the mantle of colonel within Vermont's militia. He became Vermont's militia paymaster general, deputy secretary to the colony's governor, assistant to Vermont's treasurer, and a participant in Vermont's Council of Safety, the shadow government supplanting the dominion of royal British overseers, and all before he was 29 years old. Oh, and by the way, he never went to college. So at the age of 29, after the Revolutionary War, he embarked on a political journey, securing a seat in the new Vermont House of Representatives from the year 1779 until 1783. He established a township, Fairhaven, Vermont, and bore the office of clerk within the Vermont's court, where he was quickly impeached for withholding the court's records from the governor of Vermont. This makes him want to be a judge. So thereafter, he ascended the mantle of assistant judge in his county, even after his impeachment as a clerk. Further, in the year 1787, he once more secured election to Vermont's House of Representatives, a tenure extending until 1796. Amidst these years as a citizen's voice, he erected and managed a grist mill, saw mill, paper mill, and an iron foundry. Additionally, he fostered a printing press, started a newspaper, and oversaw his agricultural domains. A life of ceaseless labor indeed. Perchance, he ventured to vie for Congress in the newly formed Assembly for the United States. Alas, he tasted defeat in the second, third, and fourth gatherings of Congress. And with his third loss, he pursued the tactic that seems to be a new and unheard of idea every single time it happens. He challenged the election results, and like it seems to happen every single time today, he lost his challenge to the election. But undaunted, he triumphed in his fourth bid for the House of Representatives, assuming a seat within the 5th Congress. This guy never quit. And now, the tale taketh a turn to mirth, and lo, let it astonish thee, for thou shalt find that whatsoever horrors, embarrassments, undemocratic follies, or contradictions to our nation's ideals thou dost perceive in the political machinations of today, they may well have transpired afore, perhaps even more shockingly, albeit in another coordinate of our temporal and spatial tapestry. On January 30th in the year 1798, whilst the August House did convene, a discourse did ensue concerning the fate of one Senator William Blunt. Known for the Blunt conspiracy, it entailed a sinister design to collude with the British, aiming to wrest control of Louisiana and Florida from the Spanish and seeking recompense for bankruptcies accrued from land speculation and guarantees for colonial merchants. Amidst this deliberation, a certain representative named Roger Griswold, hailing from Connecticut's fair domain, sought discourse with Matthew Lyon concerning this grave affair of Blunt conspiracy. Lyon, forsooth, chose to disregard him, ignoring him entirely, feigning as though Griswold was not even there, mostly because they were from different political parties. Grievous affront this was to Griswold, leading him to bestow upon Lyon a most unsavory epithet. A scoundrel, he did call him, bold and unapologetic, since scoundrel at the time was a really bad, mean, awful, smelly, disgusting thing to say, a term to inspire the utmost disdain, it did rouse Lyon's ire. He declared himself no scoundrel, rather a champion of the common folk, an advocate for the unassuming masses. Griswold, in retort to jest, shall thee defend the common man with thy wooden sword? Aye, the tale of Lion's wooden sword, a relic from the days of guarding wheat fields, had spread far and wide, exploited by his rivals to tarnish his name during the campaigns. Verily, Griswold did use it as an instrument of mockery. Classy, right? So, Griswold mocks Matthew Lyon about defending the common man with a wooden sword, and Matthew Lyon holds his temper for about 0.2 seconds before spitting a whole bunch of freshly salivated tobacco juice all over Griswold in the middle of Congress. The spitting lion, as his moniker did become in the gazettes, did proffer apologies to the entire House of Representatives later, stating that he didn't know they were in, quote, session, and meant no disrespect, imploring them to perceive no slight against their esteemed house. Yet Griswold, feeling that the apology should have been directed at him and him alone, 
kindled a flame of vengeance. Fifteen days following the ignoble shower of tobacco spit, within the very midst of a congressional session, Griswold did approach Lyon, wielding a stout wooden cane and proceeding furiously to start beating Lyon on the head and shoulders. Lyon, in defense, seized a pair of fire tongs from the hearth, wielding them as weapons against the assault. Thus did the scene devolve into a most primal personal battle. Fellow members of the house did rush to intervene, prying the combatants apart, restoring order to the halls. When they had been pulled asunder and confined to their respective factions and political parties, cooler heads did prevail. They calmed their tempers in front of the assembly, and in pure democratic spirit, a committee was convened to investigate the spectacle that everybody had just witnessed. But they felt they needed a committee to talk about it. This committee recommended censure for both Matthew Lyon and Roger Griswold, yet when the two stood before their fellow representatives, they vowed to comport themselves with decorum, offering contrition for their actions and pledging good conduct henceforth. The House, swayed by their political promises and perceiving an air of reconciliation, rejected the motion for censure and the past turned and the past transgressions were consigned to history via newspapers and books. In the same year's later months, one of the strangest laws in the history of the United States was passed, the Alien and Sedition Act. The latter components of this law, the Sedition Act, did seek to criminalize false and malicious statements, whether spoken or written, directed in any aspect of the federal government, including individuals in the government, which, as it turns out, directly violates the very first amendment of the constitution imagine democrats and republicans today passing a law that makes it illegal to speak any bad or have any disagreements with the ruling party of the country what is this canada indeed with a mere 11 years of the constitution's establishment a law was put in place that the constitution itself stated could never ever 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 happen why because it seems the government has feelings too, and their feelings are super duper important, and our government functionaries are more important in the eyes of our most gracious God than the us, the common citizenry. Okay, they never said that, but a smart person can read between the lines. And remember, this was over 200 years ago that these narcissists were doing this crap. Matthew Lyon harbored a profound disdain for this law, discerning its implications. Voted against it, he did, as did his compatriots of the Democratic-Republican faction. Yet the majority, the Federalist faction, did carry it to fruition, and it was signed into law by none other than President John Adams, which makes me shake my head in dismay when people talk about what our founding fathers wanted. Newsflash! They disagreed on a lot of stuff back then, too, and they didn't like to be criticized either. <laughs> And so it was on the 31st day of July in the year 1798, a mere fortnight after the law's enactment, the Vermont Journal did publish a letter from Matthew Lyon that he actually penned before the law was passed, in which he criticized President John Adams for his dealings with France. On the first day of October, he chose to grace his own periodical entitled The Scourge of Aristocracy and Repository of Important Political Truths with an editorial. In this opus, he did again launch criticisms at John Adams and his policies. And for this, he was indicted. And within the span of a single week, he had to stand trial. Charges did encompass the following. First, he was pinning a missive to a newspaper critical of the president before the law's enactment. However, under Federalist coercion, the newspaper did publish it after the law's passage in order to help construct a case against him. Second, publishing letters penned by a political poet, wherein criticism of the government and Federalists were vocalized, although, again, these were published before the law was enacted. Publishing forth letters from a French envoy, which decried and critiqued relations betwixt the United States and France, was his third charge, and the fourth was the publication of his editorial in his own newspaper, just a mere week prior to his trial. Lyon did beseech the court for respite or, or a delay that he might procure legal counsel, but yet his pleas were spurned and he was compelled to defend himself within a week of writing his editorial. Think about it. 
You print an article, and within one week, you are indicted and forced to stand trial without giving the opportunity to find an attorney. So he had to defend himself, and his defense consisted of that which most reasonable minds might concur. First, the court lacked jurisdiction, as the law itself was unconstitutional, and no court was empowered to enforce it. Second, the writings were innocent just mere tools of information. Three, the riotings verily spake truth, devoid of malicious intent or falsehood, for truth cannot be deemed malicious. In his first two charges, he sought to assert that ex post facto charges were unlawful, which means you can't charge someone for deeds lawful before a law's enactment that deems it criminal. And interestingly, the judge in this case dismissed the defense outright. So recall this is a sitting congressman, a veteran of the Revolutionary War, a man of commerce, a leader of the state, and a founding father. And yet after one mere hour of deliberation, the jury that was stacked found him guilty. His sentence, four months of imprisonment and a fine of $1,000, a sum he could not evade, shackled until paid, an amount equivalent to 25000 of today's dollars. A four-month sojourn within a cell of 16 feet by 12 feet while he was still a sitting congressman. So his fellow brethren of the Green Mountain Boys, remember those guys whose banjos resonated like muskets reports and whose muskets harmonies sung freedom song, had in mind to liberate him from the jail and foment insurrection as a mustard militia. Yet Matthew Lyon beseeched them for peace, even amid his anger for his political imprisonment. And lo, even while imprisoned, he didst persist in running for another term in Congress. Thus did a sitting congressperson reside within a prison's confines whilst he pursued re-election, winning his seat anew while incarcerated with more than twice the votes garnered by his opponent. A feat unprecedented, a victory secured from behind bars. He fulfilled his term and in the year 1801 set his sights upon Kentucky, a new chapter in life commencing. He bade farewell to the state where he had resided resided, fought, and represented for 35 years. His Vermont businesses he relinquished, venturing into new domains, mills, distilleries, and shipwright endeavors. He served within Kentucky's House of Representatives and resumed his tenure within Congress, bearing the mantle of Congressman Matthew Lyon from Kentucky. In the 8th through 11th Congresses, spanning from 1803 until 1811, but the government's capriciousness yet meddled in its affairs. A contract for crafting ships for the War of 1812 he secured from the government's hand, investing all in supplies, only to find the government reneging on payment, leaving him in bankruptcy at 63 years old. Four years it took to extricate himself from this morass, at which juncture he emerged as a federally sanctioned merchant for the Cherokee Nation in Arkansas. And in one last, I don't believe these election results are real moment he runs for the arkansas territory delegation to congress loses and contests the elections the governor and election officials would not even allow him to inspect the ballots so congress said he didn't have enough evidence to overturn the election as congress said they didn't have authority to enforce a recount interesting so in essence he asked for a recount the Arkansas Territory didn't approve anybody to come and check the votes, and the U.S. Congress said, well, since they didn't let you see anything, now you have no proof and we can't investigate it, so you're screwed. Uh, Matthew the Spitting Lion, the free speech champion, his time of spitting and speaking freely and contesting elections came to a mortal end in 1822 at 73 years old. All of this is real, every bit of it, and hopefully serves as a reminder that politics has always been crazy. We just get to experience the crazy that we chose together.